Alongside the holiness of place and person is the holiness of time, something Parashas Emar charts in a deceptively simple list of festivals and holy days. Now, time plays an enormous part in Judaism. The first thing declared holy was a day, Shabbat, at the conclusion of creation. The first mitzvah given to the Jewish people as a whole prior to the Exodus was the command to sanctify time by determining and applying the Jewish calendar. The prophets were the first to see God in history, seeing time itself as the arena of the divine human encounter. Virtually every other religion and civilization before and since has identified God with timelessness. Isaiah Berlin used to quote Alexander Herzen, who said about the Slavs that they had no history, only geography. Jews, he said, were the exact opposite. They had a great deal of history, but all too little geography. Much time, but little space. So time in Judaism is an essential medium of the spiritual life. But there's one feature of the Jewish approach to time that's received less attention than it should, namely the duality that runs through the entire Jewish structure of time. Take, for instance, the calendar as a whole. Christianity uses a solar calendar. Islam uses a lunar one. But Judaism uses both. We count time both by the monthly cycle of the moon and the seasonal cycle of the sun. Then consider the day. Days normally have just one beginning, whether it's at nightfall or daybreak or midnight, whatever. For Judaism, for calendar purposes, the Jewish day begins at nightfall. It was evening, it was morning, one day. But if you look at the structure of the prayers, the morning prayer instituted by Abraham, the afternoon prayer instituted by Isaac and Ma'ariv, the evening prayer by Jacob, there's a sense in which the worship of the day starts in the morning and not the night before. Years, too, usually have one fixed beginning, a new year. In Judaism, according to the Mishnah in Rosh Hashanah, there are no less than four new years. The first of Elul is the new year for tithing animals. The 15th of Shvat to Bishvat is the new year for trees. Now those are specific and subsidiary, but there are two new years that are fundamental. According to the Torah, the first month of the year is Nisan. That's the day the earth became dry after the flood. It was the day the Israelites received their first command as a people. One year later, it was the day the tabernacle was dedicated and the service of the priests inaugurated. So, in a sense, New Year is the first of Nisan, but the festival we call Rosh Hashanah New Year falls six months later on the first of Tishri. Holy time itself comes in two forms, as Emma makes clear. There are Shabbos on the one hand, and the festivals on the other, and they're announced separately. What's the difference? Shabbat was sanctified by God at the beginning of time for all time. But the festivals are sanctified by the Jewish people to whom was given the authority and responsibility for fixing the calendar. Hence the difference in the blessings we say. On Shabbat we praise God who sanctifies Shabbat. On the festivals we praise God who sanctifies Israel and the holy times, meaning it's God who sanctifies Israel, but Israel who sanctifies the holy times, determining on which days the festivals will form. Even within the festivals there's a dual cycle. One is formed by the three pilgrimage festivals, Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot. They are days that represent the key historic moments of the dawn of Jewish time, the Exodus, the giving of the Torah, and the 40 years of wandering in the desert. They are festivals of history. But the other cycle is formed by the number seven and the concept of holiness, the seventh day, Shabbat, the seventh month, Tishri, with its three festivals of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, the seventh year, Shemitah, and the 
jubilee year marking the completion of seven seven-year cycles. These times, with the exception of Sukkot, which belongs to both cycles, have less to do with history than with what, for want of a better word, we might call metaphysics and jurisprudence, ultimate truths about the universe, the human condition, and the laws, natural and moral, under which we live. Each is about creation. Shabbos is a reminder of it. Rosh Hashanah is an anniversary of it. And they're about divine sovereignty, justice, and judgment, together with the human condition of life, death, and mortality. So on Yom Kippur, we face justice and judgment. On Sukkot, Shmini Atzeres, we pray for rain, we celebrate nature by holding the products of nature, the Lulav and Esrog, and we read the book of Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, Tanakh's most profound set of reflections about mortality. In the seventh and jubilee years, we acknowledge God's ultimate ownership of the land of Israel and the children of Israel. So we let slaves go. We release debts. We let the land rest and restore most property to its original owners. All of these have to do not with God's interventions into history, but with his role as creator and owner of the universe. One way of seeing the difference between the first cycle and the second is to compare the prayers on Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot with the prayers on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The Amidas of Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot all begin with a statement of Jewish particularity. You chose us from all other peoples. By contrast, the Amida for uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur begins by speaking of it's, it speaks about all your works, all you have made, all you have created. The emphasis on is on universality, about the judgment that affects all of creation of everything that lives. Even Sukkot has a universalist thrust, with its 70 sacrificial bulls representing the 70 nations. According to Zachariah, it's the one festival that will one day be celebrated by all nations. Why the duality? Because God is both the God of nature and the God of culture, the God of everyone in general and the God of the people of the covenant in particular. He's the author of both scientific law, which applies to everyone, and the religious ethical law, which applies the Torah to the Jewish people alone. We encounter God both in cyclical time, which is time as it exists in nature, and linear historical time, which is time as it occurs in history. This very duality gives rise to two different kinds of religious leaders, the Navi, the prophet, who sees God in history, and the Kohen, who lives in cyclical time, the order of the days, the weeks, the months, which never changes. Since the ancient Greeks, people have searched for one single principle that would explain everything, or the single point Archimedes sought from which to move the world. Judaism tells us there is no such point, no one simple account of reality. Reality is more complicated than that. There's not even a single concept of time. At the very least, we need two perspectives to be able to see reality in three dimensions, and that applies to time as well as space. Jewish time has two different rhythms at once. Judaism is to the spirit what Niels Bohr's complementarity theory is to quantum physics. In physics, light is both a wave and a particle. In Judaism, time is both historical and natural. Unexpected, counterintuitive, certainly. But this account of time is glorious in its refusal to ri simplify time's rich complexity, the ticking clock, the growing plant, the aging body, and the ever-deepening mind. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.